Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the CIFA workshop series webinar, ESG and investment funds, brought to you in partnership with Refinitiv, CIFA and Invest Cyprus. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. In today's session, the on-demand version of this webcast will be shared with you via email in the next few days. This is being streamed through your computer, so for the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or your headset volume is turned up. For the best viewing experience, we recommend you close any programs or browser sessions running in the background. This will help conserve your bandwidth. And some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are not progressing, please push F5 on your keyboard or Command R on a Mac. That will refresh your browser. At the bottom of your screen are multiple widgets, and I'd like to highlight a few of these to you. If you have any questions during the session, you can submit these through the Q&A widget. We will try and answer during the session, but if we run out of time, we will answer these via email. And please note, we do record all questions. There are additional materials available in the resource list, so please download any that might you, you might find useful. And you can find out more about our speakers using the speaker bio widget. We also value your feedback, so please do complete the pop-up survey at the end of this webcast. I am now honored to introduce our moderator for today, Deputy Director General of Invest Cyprus, Mario Stanosis. Over to you, Mario. Thank you, Renee. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to our workshop organized with the great contribution of Refinitiv, Invest Cyprus, and CIFA focusing on ESG and investment funds. Thank you, Rene, for taking us through some key elements on housekeeping. I'm sure this workshop will run through very smoothly, given the hard efforts put forward from your end, your team at Refinitiv, and may I also thank the personnel of Invest Cyprus and CIFA for their contribution in making this event possible. I am truly excited to chair this event today as it will be focusing on a matter, big and friendly topic such as that of ESG in the context of the fund industry. I am confident that by the end of the webinar, our distinguished speakers and panelists will manage to take you through the fundamentals of the ESG landscape and that you will acquire several take home points from the seminar. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Andreas Yasemidis, CIFA president, for a brief welcome note. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marios. Uh, dear Vice Chairman of the Cyprus Security and Exchange Commission, Mr. George Haridis, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of uh, Cyprus Investment Fund Association, I would like to welcome you to our third uh, workshop from our newly launched project CIFA Workshop Series. Uh, which has been initiated in the context of CIFA's mission to continuously prove the level of professionalism within the Cyprus fund industry. This workshop is organized in cooperation with the Invest Cyprus and the Definitiv, and I would like uh, taking this opportunity to thank both organizations for uh, the smooth cooperation. It's intended to serve as an introduction to the fundamental of uh, ESG, as we may call it, the initials which stand for environment, social and governance in the context of the fund industry. Um, ESG performance is indeed increasingly critical for investment funds and fund managers, which may be under scrutiny from various stakeholders, including investors, regulators, um, employees and others. This webinar, this webinar will share insights and particular guidance uh, in an attempt to analyze the issues surrounding ESG by bringing together speakers on key issues, both from the regulatory sphere as well as from the industry. I'm particularly glad to welcome two speakers joining us from a pro today, namely Elena Filipova, head of uh, ESG of Refinitiv, which is joining us from London, and Christopher Sotiriu, investment funds lawyer, who is joining us from Luxembourg. 
We are proud to have seen a large number of participants who join us uh, in our previous workshop to attend again today. And we would like to welcome the new attendees uh, who are uh, joining us for the first time. Uh, further to a decision by the Board of uh, Directors of SIPA, all our workshops will be open uh, to the general public in an effort uh, to give more uh, a training and informative seminar that will benefit the industry experts, external decision makers, opinion format, but also keep the wider uh, public up to date with respect to the Cyprus fund industry. Throughout the uh, turbulent times we currently experience, uh, the Cyprus Investment Fund Association has been placing all its effort to promote Cyprus as a fund jurisdiction of choice by attracting international players to relocate their operations here and create a suitable ecosystem for them to function. As years go by, the impact of uh, C5 efforts uh, is becoming more and more vital and has been certainly paid off, uh, and this observation is now evident to all involved parties. Uh, to this end, I would like to take the opportunity to express my deepest appreciation to everyone who have supported SIFA and the Cyprus fund industry over the past years in achieving the, the above uh, outcome. My warmest uh, thanks must also be given to the speakers who honor us uh, with their presence today, as well as the personnel of Invest Cyprus and Refinity for their high level of professionalism, which contributed towards the success of this uh, workshop. Uh, having said that, as part of our workshop, success relies on your interaction and feedback as attendees. We we'll appreciate any, any proposal from your end with respect to any topics that would like to be covered in the workshop to follow, and any, any, any feedback uh, regarding our uh, workshop today. Uh, throughout our report, we will achieve our mission uh, to strengthen the position of, of Cyprus as a hub for investment funds. And the latest, uh, uh, the latest announcement by SISEC regarding uh, the volume of asset under management is a clear indication that the fund industry is going extremely well. And uh, we believe that Cyprus has all the ingredients in place to continue growing as a reputable EU fund hub. I do hope you enjoy the workshop today. I'm confident that it will be truly beneficial and informative with respect to ESG consideration on funds. Thank you very much. Marios, back to you. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, indeed, the uh, focus on educating the stakeholders within the surrounding of the fund industry is key for the expansion of the sector. And it is vital that CIFA is aware of this fact and places substantial efforts to this end. We now move to Mr. George Gambanellas, CEO of Invest Cyprus and Vice President of CIFA, up next for his own introductory remarks. George, the stage is yours. Thank you, Marios. Um, I would like uh, to welcome you all from our end, and I would like to thank uh, Refinity, CIFA, and Invest Cyprus for all their efforts in making this event a success. On behalf of Invest Cyprus, I would like to welcome you and um, allow me to uh, say a few words about who we are. Uh, Invest Cyprus is the investment authority of the government of Cyprus dedicated to promoting the country as a destination for investment, but also as an international business and financial center. We seek to provide certainty around all aspects of operating a business in Cyprus and supporting potential investors in developing their business case in our country. As a European Union member state, Cyprus benefits from the harmonization of EU financial services regulation and is continuously upgrading its legislative and regulatory regime, aiming to establish the country as one of the leading investment fund jurisdictions in Europe. And the numbers speaks for themselves, as we heard from Andreas. In addition to attracting uh, more funds to set up in Cyprus uh, or through Cyprus, our aim is to engage uh, institutional investors in investing in our country. In this context, we have introduced an one-stop shop 
for investment funds, private equity, family offices, to support the landing of high value investments into greenfield and brownfield projects that align with key government strategies. As you are going to hear later on in the panel, our project bank is continuously updated with available market opportunities. It includes projects that fall uh, under uh, strategic uh, sectors like healthcare, tourism, hospitality, education, technology, and other uh, infrastructure projects. At Invest Cyprus, we place high in our priorities the promotion of sustainable investments and green projects. And our main goal is developing agile investor attraction strategy to target and expand our network uh, of interested investors into sustainable investments. I would like to thank you all once again for joining us and hope you have a productive webinar ahead. Thank you. Thank you, George, for these introductory remarks and for also briefly introducing the mission of Invest Cyprus, as it is important to mention it also for attendees from abroad who hear from us for the first time. Jumping now to introduce to you Mr. George Soharidis, Vice Chairman of SISEC, who always and with great pleasure accepts our invitation to speak at our events and seminars, and this showcases the commitment of the regulator to support the fan industry of Cyprus. George, thank you for being here with us today. I see you'll be focusing on the regulatory perspective on ESG, and we are eager to hear from you. George, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Um, <clears throat> distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all. First, let me say that it's a real pleasure for me to address this live workshop, the third that CIFA is organizing, on such important topic as sustainable investments. So I would like to thank uh, Mario Stanusis, George Campanellas, and Andreas Yasemidis for this kind of invitation. So the COVID-19 um, crisis has not only brought on the greatest recession since the World War, uh, the Second World War, I would say bigger than the global banking crisis of 2007 and 2008, but investors are also calling it the 21st century first sustainability crisis, and one that has renewed the focus on climate change, acting as a wake-up call for decision makers to prioritize a more sustainable approach to investment. And the European Union uh, is, is currently at the vanguard of environmental, social, and governance measures. Two areas of development in particular are likely to have widespread repercussions for businesses. Newly implemented obligations for ESG disclosures and likely forthcoming mandatory human rights, environmental, and governance due diligence. These measures involve both new obligations of disclosure as well as potentially substantive obligations to address ESG issues connected to companies' businesses. Their implementation is likely to have significant effects for both companies domiciled in the European Union as well as companies operating within the European Union. Importantly, as well as compliance concerns, businesses will need to consider the attendant legal risks of publicly sharing human rights environmental risks in their business operations and supply chain more widely. So in line with the EU action plan for uh, financing sustainable growth, uh, SISEC has confirmed its commitment to fostering compliance with sustainable finance standards. So in, in preparation for the new sustainable finance disclosures regulation, what is known as SFDR, uh, which became applicable in March of 2021, SISEC has created a dedicated section on its website on sustainable finance, which also provides information on uh, SFDR. So 
So going on to the regulation, uh, the newly established regulation, uh, first starting with the SFDR. The SFDR was introduced by the European Commission alongside the taxonomy regulation and the low carbon benchmark regulation as part of a package of, re of legisl legislative measures arising from the European Commission's action plan on sustainable finance. So what is the S SFDR? The SFDR aims to bring a level playing field for financial market participants and financial advisors on transparency in relations to sustainability risks, consideration of adverse sustainability impacts in their investment processes, and the provision of sustainability-related information with respect to financial products. So the SFDR requires the asset managers, such as alternative investment fund managers and usage managers, to provide prescript and standardized disclosures on how the ESG factors, the environmental, social, and governance factors, are integrated at both at the entity level and at the product level. Uh, going on to the taxonomy regulation, which is the second uh, regulation under this uh, umbrella, the taxonomy regulation establishes the criteria for determining whether an economic activity is environmentally sustainable for the purposes of identifying the degree of environmental sustainability of an investment. So as regards to asset management, the regulation applies in broad terms to asset managers under MIFID II, the usage directive, the alternative investment fund managers directive, and the financial products under their management, as well as to other EU granted uh, IEs. And finally, the low carbon benchmarks regulation amends the EU benchmark regulation in two ways. First, it introduces two new benchmark classifications, the EU climate transition benchmarks and the EU Paris aligned benchmarks. And second, it requires administrators of ESG benchmarks to publish certain information. Administrators of benchmarks that pursue ESG objectives must publish an explanation of how key elements of the methodology reflect the ESG factors and explain in the benchmark statement how the ESG factors are reflected for each benchmark or family of benchmarks. In general, the information provided should enable the national supervisor, supervisory authorities, the NCAs, the national competent authorities, to easily ver verify compliance with the disclosure obligation and to enforce that obligation in accordance with applicable national law. When financial market participants do not take into account the criteria for environmentally sustainable investments, they should su submit a statement to that effect. So we urge market participants to take all the necessary steps and ensure full compliance with the regulatory requirements especially with the SFDR disclosure obligations and ensure smooth implementation of these new ESG policies. Specifically, EU funds and non-EU alternative investment funds, which are marketed within the EU, are required to update their prospectuses, to provide investors with information on how sustainability risks are taken into account in the investment decision-making process applicable to the relevant fund. Investors in ESG funds also must be provided with significant additional information, both prior to investing in the fund and during the life of the investment through periodic reports and information made available on the website of the management company. In order to determine the scope of disclosure obligations imposed of them under the ESG framework, Management companies will therefore need in the first instance to contact an inventory uh, of funds of under management to determine whether any fund constitutes an ESG fund, and if so, categorize the relevant fund. They will also need to determine whether the relevant fund contributes to an environmental objective or promotes environmental characteristics, as this category of fund is subject to additional disclosure obligations set down in the taxonomy regulation. 
um, we will challenge firms and take actions where we see a risk of mislabeling, misrepre misrepresenting, or mis-selling in relation to sustainable finance to protect consumers and prevent them from being misled. And you probably heard the title of, of greenwashing, so such risks are encapsulated in the term uh, greenwashing. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, in Cyprus, we have already registered some alternative funds with an investment policy focusing on environmental, social, and governance factors, which is promising. But we're yet to see a large-scale shift towards responsible investments. But I think um, we're moving towards the, di the right direction. The latest data gathered from asset managers in, in Cyprus showed that about 40 million of funds under management out of a total of around 10 billion have a sustainable investment strategy. Still, it's a small percentage, but as I said, I think we are, uh, we will see in the next few years that that, that percentage is going to increase and we will be moving towards more sustainable uh, investments. So concluding, sustainable finance is a key concept for modern businesses, but also for, um, uh, for the, also a great challenge. As SISEC, we will provide what is necessary for asset managers to consider these options. These can be tax incentives, reduction of capital requirements, and strengthening of the license, licensing process. We will also actively support firms and entrepreneurs who are developing greener fintech solutions that seek to automate and enhance analytical capabilities of firms to handle ESG information under our innovation hub. So um, I, I should mention here uh, what is our innovation hub. An innovation hub was established by SISEC uh, in 2018. The aim of this innovation hub is to provide guidance for um, innovative uh, financial solutions, whether it's in the fintech, regtech, subtech, uh, or green tech area, uh, to provide guidance in, in, in terms of how these, um, uh, how these solutions fit within the regulatory framework. And our purpose and our um, um, aspiration is to convert this innovation hub east into a regulatory sandbox where these types of, uh, of fintech solutions will be able to be tested uh, as a pilot study in the market before, uh, before they are placed out and before they get the approval by size. So we need to foster investor participation and greater cross-border investment, thereby boosting the productive use of capital and diversifying the sources of funding needed for financing the recovery and the transformation into a greener and a more sustainable economic model. So that's it, and I would like to thank you all for your kind inter inter attention, and uh, Mario's back to you. Thank you, George, for your presentation. Indeed, the role of SISEC is vital in encouraging all participants are compliant with the regulatory requirements. And it is interesting to have heard that in Cyprus, there are already some alternative funds focusing their investment policies on environmental, social, and governance factors. Up next, we are moving to Mrs. Elena Filipova, Global Head of ESG at Refinitiv, an LSEG business. It is a true honor to have with us Ms. Filipova here today, who shall be elaborating on Europe's lead on ESG. Elena, a warm welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marius, and um, welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be joining this very important and uh, quite um, urgent conversation. Um, maybe before I start, I'll just add that uh, in addition to my uh, responsibility at Refinitiv, um, I also have worked and supported the European Commission and European regulators on the Action Plan on Sustainable Finance. Um, as a, a member of the technical expert group on sustainable finance. Um, so happy also to take any more um, 
specific and detailed questions that the audience might have on this action plan if, uh, if there are any at, uh, at the right time. I think it's probably good uh, to take a moment just to talk about why are we even here and talking about sustainability right now. And I think it's um, broadly speaking uh, agreed nowadays uh, across all regions that sustainability is a prerequisite for economic growth. It's a prerequisite for building back resilient financial markets. And sustainability is no longer deemed as a nice to have um, add on after we meet our financial uh, objectives. Rather, it is, um, it is a must have for uh, financial markets to continue growing because many of the topics covered under the ESG umbrella present very real systematic financial risks. So we no longer talk about it as a philanthropic activities. I think it's a very important distinction, especially in the region that, uh, that uh, you all are uh, in um, for this conversation today. Um, but it is uh, part of uh, fundamental um, financial resilience. Um, the, the, we, we mentioned COVID, and I think it, I, I do want to uh, expand on that for a moment, uh, because the COVID pandemic is not an isolated case, as um, world scientists have concluded. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand that we've entered a century of disruptions and high volatility. And we have to rethink how capital markets, how businesses operate to be fit for purpose, to be able to sustain and continue to exist and thrive within the new context of reality, which is disruptive. Therefore, we do see those fundamental changes coming in very rapidly. But taking us a, a step back into actually why are regulators now all over this agenda? And um, I will highlight that 2015 was actually a monumental year for our society. In 2015, uh, the world reached an agreement on our climate trajectory and the climate goals with very concrete milestones and timelines to achieve those under the Paris Agreement umbrella. So this is really the direction of travel that all jurisdictions have committed to deliver and meet. Um, and the second big commitment uh, or achievement in 2015 was the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, which is a framework of 17 uh, um, environmental and social challenges presented to our generation to solve for if we are to to leave um, what we received, but not less, to future generations. Um, and, and really to think about these two key developments, it's the strategy, equivalent to a business strategy that the company will set for itself. This is our, our world strategy. And um, nations went back then home and started drawing how do we implement that now? We've committed to our strategy. How do we make it happen? And um, this is um, what we're experiencing is by no means an EU phenomenon. It's a global uh, phenomenon. It's a global transformative change and shift. And all regions and nations are pursuing the same end goals and objectives. We've seen some extremely bold commitments coming from uh, China, from the US, uh, uh, where it was probably not likely to happen um, a year or two ago. Um, however, the EU role, I think, is, is, is a very unique one because the European uh, Union made a very clear commitment uh, shortly after uh, 2015 to lead the sustainable finance agenda because it, it, it is very natural for uh, European culture. Sustainability comes very natural. It is part of our culture. 
and um, the, the European regulators committed to set, uh, to lead by example and create the blueprint for sustainable finance. And I must say that what we've seen emerging in the last couple of years is, is, um, is phenomenal. It's, it's what I would call uh, regulatory innovation. And I think that the market should see the sustainable finance a regulatory um, uh, initiatives coming out of Brussels is different to other regulation that is hitting financial markets. Um, at the heart of sustainable finance regulation is the word enablement. It is trying to solve for the problem, how do we enable and mobilize public and, and private uh, markets to finance the shift towards sustainable future? And there are many known gaps that currently put um, put a stop to this mobilization. As, as uh, we just heard, the uh, number of AUM in Cyprus um, allocated to ESG strategies is very small. It is the same uh, pretty much everywhere else. Although there is so much momentum, so much development, um, capital allocation is still slow. But it has to. This has to change very quickly and very urgently because the the climate agenda and the sustainability agenda is one that requires all of us to act on it yesterday. We're, we're already late, so we have to move very quickly. Um, so EU um, is a leader on on the sustainability agenda, and I must say that. Um, the action plan on sustainable finance is by far the most comprehensive and ambitious regulatory effort in this area around the world. There's been so much work put behind developing common standards and definitions to make sure that the industry is empowered and moves into sustainability with confidence because that's what's missing right now. The confidence is, is not there yet because um, there are different definitions, different reporting standards, um, a lack of data because reporting is for most part voluntary. All ESG data that we have available today is because of the uh, investor pressure on, on issuers to disclose the information. So investors have really been carrying the burden of this agenda on their shoulders for quite some time. So it's absolutely the right time to involve others in this um, in this transformation if we are to see the, the shift of capital that is uh, required. Um, and I'm saying it's the most comprehensive and ambitious plan um, because of the uh, multitude and diverse portfolio of regulatory initiatives that touches on uh, the whole ecosystem in, in financial markets. Um, we, already today, we discussed a number of those key initiatives, whether that's the EU taxonomy or uh, the um, SFTR uh, disclosure regulation and a corporate sustainability reporting directive, which is in proposal stage to replace the current NFDR, um, as well as the quite innovative climate benchmarks, which um, enable market participants to benchmark uh, any financial instrument performance against a true climate benchmark. Um, so the, the, the variety of instruments there is quite um, comprehensive. Uh, but it's important to remind everyone that this is a journey. It's a journey for us in the private sector. It's equally a journey for the regulators in the public sector. Um, uh, we don't, I think it will be very unrealistic to expect that everything will work perfectly day one. Um, and therefore, the sentiment around sustainable finance regulation from the regulators is one of collaboration, very strong collaboration with the public sector to make sure that these initiatives and regulatory uh, work streams work for the market. 
and therefore they are developed in collaboration with the market. I've mentioned that I, as, as representative of Refinitiv, have um, been channeling not only the voice of our customers to make sure that, that they are properly represented and heard as the texts are drafted, but also that we've landed the, our data and expertise to make sure that regulators understand that the reality in which capital markets operate today and where are the limitations to make sure that compliant requirements are uh, can be met by market participants in both short term and long term. So you see in many of the regulatory initiatives, there is different phasing put in place. It's because of that to enable the market to work through those challenges, as well as make the connections between regulations as ultimately it is supposed to work together. Um, and I believe it goes without saying that market innovation and regulation need to go hand in hand. And it is something that we've um, communicated uh, over and over again to, in, in Brussels. And um, the regulation is built with that in mind. It really aims to establish the baseline, a common baseline for everyone to improve consistency and comparability in the market, to improve trust in the market, in the sustainable finance market, but then leave plenty of room for innovation. This space is extremely exciting. It's full of opportunities and it's full of, of, of innovation. Um, and, and I do believe that it is um, uh, the area that uh, we're gonna see a lot of growth emerging in the coming months and years. Um, I will make a last uh, remark um, that um, for this agenda to be successful, uh, there are three main components. Um, from from our perspective. The first is the need for uh, data that is widely accessible, comparable, timely and, and actionable. As I mentioned, we've been servicing the financial industry for 20 years with ESG data. So there is plenty of data out there, but there are a lot of challenges which, may, which makes it more costly for issuers, data providers and users of this information to, to take the most out of it. So there is a, a lot of improvement around the data that needs to happen in the market. The second prerequisite is consistency between global frameworks and standards. And there is a lot of uh, collaboration and work uh, specifically around standard convergence. And the argue most important prerequisite is education and closing the skill gap. Sustainable finance is a new field for capital markets. It, it talks in different language. It talks in emissions, megawatt hours, uh, biodiversity. It doesn't use the finance language of PL uh, costs and, and so on. Um, so there is a, a big need for education and upskilling that needs to happen. And, and it is an area that we at Refinitiv have collaborated extensively on over the last couple of years to support the industry in closing that knowledge gap. So with that, I will pause here. It's a huge uh, topic. Happy to delve into any specific areas of interest during, during the Q&A session. Um, so thank you for your time and back to you, Marius. Thank you, Elena, for your useful input and for giving us an accurate outlook on the overall picture, on the European perspective in the context of ESG. Welcoming now on screen, Christophe Sodiriu, a Cypriot by origin, currently based in Luxembourg and part of the law firm Bonn Stegen and Partners, who shall be analyzing ESG considerations from the Luxembourg standpoint. Christophoros, the stage is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, greetings from Luxembourg, the, the heart of green investing. First of all, I would like to take the opportunity to thank CIFA, Invest uh, Cyprus and Refinity for this opportunity to talk about ESG considerations from the Luxembourg standpoint. My name is Christopher Sudirio. I'm a lawyer here in the Investment Funds Department of Bonn Station and Partners, which is one of the long 
and well-established law firms here in investment funds. Um, so today we're going to talk, as the uh, title mentions, uh, ESG considerations from the Luxembourg standpoint. And just to give you a summary of what we're going to talk about today in the next 10 minutes, we're going to talk about ESG being considered as a, a new era for investing in general, it goes away from traditional investing. And then we're going to talk about uh, why there has been some increase in ESG investor demand lately. We hear a lot about SFDR, a lot about green investments lately. Um, why is it so? Then I'm going to step in and say about Luxembourg, how it embraces ESG investing and what is their approach into this uh, new era. Then I'm going to touch a bit on the latest legal developments on ESG related EU laws and how Luxembourg is um, reacting to this. And then we're going to talk about ESG and the future strategy of Luxembourg when it comes to this subject. Starting off with just a few statistics, um, just to show, give you a sense uh, how important ESG is getting uh, from recently. From a recent study by FHAMAS, we show on the screen, the net assets in ESG funds grew to 1.2 trillion euros in 2020, which this amounts to a 37.1% increase from the prior year and compared to a 4.8% uh, increase for non-ESG funds. ESG equity funds also outperformed their non-ESG equivalents in 2020 because uh, obviously they were less exposed to sectors, one of the reasons. Um, they were not exposed to sectors that they were the largest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, such as energy and financial services, according to EFAMA. Another study by Morningstar um, in Europe, it shows that flows into ESG funds ballooned to 233 billion euro in 2020 from 126 billion euros the year before. Um, this is a reason, this is due to investor demand, obviously, and asset managers launched a record number of five, almost 500 uh, new ESG funds, and many clients, including many clients in our law firm as well, where they repurpose existing funds that they have into um, ESG-related impact funds. And the best sellers, according to Morningstar, are the ones who are specifically addressing the climate change in general. And uh, we ask, because last year was really busy when it comes to uh, SFDR and changing, repurposing existing funds to uh, more impact funds. So we had a talk with our clients as well. Why do you want to change your existing funds? But uh, the simple answer is that investors prefer these uh, kind of funds. And one of the main reasons, which I was also puzzled when I uh, came across it, is that ESG funds actually outperform traditional funds. Uh, the long-term uh, returns are higher than the, the traditional equity funds or uh, real estate funds, the normal ones. Um, another reason is that we have more technology and more analytics. And as Elena Filipova said, there was, a, there was a hard time to get all the analytics before. But now we have advancements in technology um, and a lot of uh, means to obtain all this data, compare them together. And this creates new opportunities in ESG investments. There has also been a change in the corporate values. So more investors lately understand more the, the value of having good, good corporate governance uh, to companies and how this uh, improves the company's ability to retain talent and employees, enhances um, company brand perception and value. And also demographics are changing. We have more millennials and Generation X uh, people um, who are taking over now in positions of power and in position to change the strategy, um, the political landscape, the business. And in a recent study by Morgan Stanley, as I say there, 84% of millennials are actually interested in sustainable investing and making an overall change. How Luxembourg embraces ESG investing. So. And, Luxembourg is considered indeed as a European leader in responsible investment fund assets, accounting for 34% of uh, the funds and 35% of all assets under management in Europe, ranking among the top green financial centers in the latest global green finance index published in 2020. Over 50% of all ESG bonds worldwide are listed on the Luxembourg Green Exchange, which is one of the recent innovations in Luxembourg. We have a green exchange specifically for green investments, 
is the world's first trading platform exclusively for sustainable financial instruments. There's also the Luxembourg Finance Labeling Agency called LuxFlag, you know, an abbreviation, which launched and dedicated climate finance quality label to ensure that the effective climate focus of investment funds in the implementation of their investment policy, as well as a specific green bond um, labeling, as I mean, to boost green investments and, of course, avoid greenwashing. In Luxembourg, there is also the Luxembourg Climate Finance uh, Accelerator, which was also established to help fund managers specializing in climate action by offering various uh, forms of financial uh, and operational support during the launch phase of a new fund structure. So overall, the government here in Luxembourg embraces ESG investing, wants to be one of the top uh, financial centers which are considering themselves to be green and allowing other fund promoters and uh, to flourish and blossom here in, in green investing. Latest legal developments on ESG laws here in Luxembourg, as we all know, and as, as it was addressed by my previous, previous panelists, uh, from 10th of March, 2021, asset managers and financial advisors must comply with certain transparency obligations regarding the impact of ESG factors on their activities and products as set out in the Disclosure Regulation 2019-2088, the so-called Level 1 obligations. Some SFDR obligations need to be complemented by the regulatory technical standards. We must, we all know about these standards. They have not yet been uh, formally adopted by the European Commission. They were developed by the European supervisory authorities. We have a final draft of, the, of these regulatory technical standards. They were published on the 2nd of February 2021. There is other Level 2 obligations. Despite not formally yet adopted, the European Commission has until the 1st of January 2022 to do this. The CSF confirmed that financial market participants need to take them into account and prepare for them. And we have a lot of clients right now that we are actually changing the pre-disclosure obligations in their prospectuses to make sure that they are aligned with the RTS. And at Luxembourg level, we have the Bill of Law 7774 was introduced on the 12th of March, 2021 to implement CSFDR taxonomy regulation, and it mostly defines the supervisory and investigative powers of the CSSF. And about the future, Luxembourg is very optimistic about the future. We have a lot of funds, fund promoters wishing to establish impact funds and um, more interested in green funds. So. Luxembourg government obviously adheres to the financial uh, participants and private sector. And in 2018, the Luxembourg government published the Luxembourg Sustainable Finance Roadmap with, in partnership with the UN Environment Program Finance Initiative on the basis of a consultation with members of the financial industry and other civil society stakeholders. It actually sets out recommendations for a comprehensive sustainable finance strategy to contribute for the UN's 2030 agenda for sustainable development and, of course, the Paris Agreement objectives. And this roadmap, uh, roadmap aims to ensure that investors enjoy a transparent offering of sustainable investment opportunities to support asset managers in establishing, managing, and distributing sustainable um, products and to help sustainable businesses access long-term funding. Lastly, in January 2020, the Luxembourg Sustainable Finance Initiative was established by the Government Industry Promotion and Development Association of Luxembourg for Finance. This non-profit association is responsible for designing and implementing a sustainable finance strategy to raise awareness of and promote and help develop sustainable finance initiatives in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. In September 2020, uh, Luxembourg's finance ministry unveiled the sustainability in bond framework, something that Luxembourg is very proud of, uh, which be becoming the first European country to adopt such a model and launch Europe's first sovereign sustainability bond, and which amounts to 1.5 billion by um, issue displayed on the LGX platform. So as we see, sorry. As we see, uh, Luxembourg has managed to do a lot so far. I'm sure that Cyprus has a lot to learn from Luxembourg. Um, it's doing great for sure. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me later. And enjoy the rest of the presentation. 
Thank you, Christophoros, for the useful insights and very informative figures. Uh, it is very enlightening to hear from an investment funds professional engaging in one of the top green financial centers, such as Luxembourg, as you mentioned, and fund industries, including Cyprus, who entered the fund sector relatively recently and have a lot to learn from the pioneers of responsible investments. Right, that brings us to our first uh, Q&A session, uh, which is open, but unfortunately we, ha we are running out of time. So I would like to uh, kindly uh, ask you to, uh, if you have any questions, to send them through. There are already some questions. We will be responding to you. Uh, please um, uh, let us know. We have your contacts, but uh, let us know of any other things that uh, you would like to um, to know, and we will be responding directly to each and every one of you uh, by email. Thank you very much. And um, uh, moving now to the second part of our webinar, which uh, comp comprises of a set of uh, four fine individuals, I will now be giving the floor to Nicole Kalasidis, Senior Legal Advisor of the Cyprus Investment Funds Association, who shall be serving uh, as a panel moderator. Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marius, for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon from uh, my end as well. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, at our third workshop, which is part of our CIFA workshop series, um, a, a project that we have launched as part of CIFA mission all stakeholders of uh, the fund industry. Uh, so it's a pleasure to moderate this panel here today. And uh, I, um, um, I would like to proceed with introducing the panelists with, uh, uh, with no further ado. Uh, we have here with us today uh, Andreas Matzas, who is a portfolio manager and executive director of GMM Fund Manager fund management, uh, which is a fund management company here in Cyprus. Uh, we also have with us uh, Mr. Omiro Sonishotis, who is the CEO and CIO of uh, Fortified Capital Limited, uh, a fund management company also based in Cyprus. And last but not least, we have with us uh, Stephanie Panayi, who is part of Invest Cyprus and uh, is holding the position of investment promotion officer and head of strategic projects. So, um, uh, being a bit conscious of the time, I will uh, start right away with our conversation. And I will start, uh, first of all, with you, uh, Andreas. So, I would like uh, you to tell us a little bit about how has the ESG affected your considerations in terms of your investment strategies, and how do you see ESG reshaping your strategies as asset managers? Hi, Nicole, this is Renee. Uh, we've lost Andreas, so we could maybe move on to the next question. Oh, okay. Well, this happens when you go live, so um, I can uh, start off then with um, uh, with Omiros. Uh, so, Omiros, um, I would like uh, your view on, uh, on, on uh, the investor's point of view. Um, in terms of uh, ESG. So uh, how do you see the development of ESG criteria integrating in the investor's perspective? Can I have your, your view on that? Can you call? Can you see me all right? I can show you. I have a problem yes. with my, my connection. Yes. Okay, can you call? Uh, uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much for the yes. We've lost you for a while, and we gave the floor to Omeros, but I'll be happy to uh, sorry to to, pro to proceed. No, with, it's okay. Um, uh, yeah. So what, what, uh, as I whatever said, you want. I'm sorry about that. 
No, I'll, I'll address the question to you, Andresa, again. So, um, as I said, uh, um, we'd like to hear your view and your take on how has the ESG affected your considerations in terms of your investment strategies and how do you see ESG reshaping your strategies as asset managers? Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you for, for the invitation to participate in this uh, very interesting event, um, which I believe is the first ESG related discussion organized by SIPA out of the many to follow us. This is a matter that we shall be discussing uh, a lot about uh, in the years to come. Uh, now coming back to your question, um, I have to admit that we have uh, very well captured the importance of environmental uh, on our decision making process. Uh, we are a fund manager activated within the European Union, and the European Union has a very strong ambition in reaching a net zero by 2050. So, of course, we have to adapt our business models and investment decision uh, to this reality. From our company's point of view, climate risk and energy transition cut across all sectors of the economy and will affect all companies um, to a certain degree and at some point in time. So we do consider how we mitigate the risks associated with climate change and how we capitalize uh, the opportunities created. Now, uh, the big issue is how do we manage in a world where we have ESG goals as well as uh, profitability goals? We see this entering to the ESG era as a transitional period. And every transitional period possesses both uh, threats as well as opportunities. So it is our mandate to recognize and avoid the threats and identify the opportunities. We as a company uh, focus on energy projects in Cyprus and in Greece, and especially in solar and uh, hydroelectric energy. Um, so with the advice of our energy sector experts, we are constructing a pipeline of energy projects which you consider will provide attractive returns to our investors and at the same time uh, have a positive impact on the environment and society. Uh, now, as much as we like green projects, we cannot hide our appetite for the shipping industry. So the question is here, um, should we reconsider our strategy on the shipping sector in the new ESG era? Uh, well, we are cautious and we are in constant discussions uh, with our shipping experts on what is being done about shipping's climate impact. And we are very pleased to see that strong efforts from the EU and the International Maritime Organization are being made together with strong commitment, of course, from the industry, uh, such as uh, the enforcement uh, of uh, sulfur carbon fuel emissions. And these uh, actions, I believe, can deliver important benefits to the environment and the society. Um, environmental concerns also create different challenges for several asset classes. Uh, the most uh, prominent is the deal of Bitcoin due to environmental concerns and the attempts made to make Bitcoin green. Currently, this is a mainstream uh, discussion being made on Bitcoin. And we should keep open here since uh, the result of this discussion will shape the future of the whole uh, crypto asset class. Um, another new wave is the creation of a relatively new asset class, which is uh, carbon credits. These until now were mainstream for industries, um, but currently the trend is shaping this alternative asset as a new mainstream uh, asset class. And we believe that we will see a huge shift towards uh, these types of assets. So yes, um, I would say that ESG does affect our strategy in both the investment decision process, the implementation process, and, and the monitoring of the investment process. Uh, we will be investing in green and we will be investing in other profitable sectors, which evidently show that efforts are being made towards a greener economy. Thank you, Andreas, for your rather insightful information. Um, so apparently that was your take uh, from the assets manager's perspective. Let's now move a little bit on the investor side. So could you please tell us a little bit about uh, how do you see the appetite on the part of the investors towards ESG? How do you see this trend evolving? 
Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we do hear that investors globally are showing an increasing interest in uh, ESG investing. Um, especially in 2021, a series of events such as COVID-19 pandemic, the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, and uh, the um, uh, BlackRock CEO, Larry Flink, a letter to CEOs, all of this had a profound impact uh, on ESG in investing. And um, as, it, as it seems, there is now a heightened sense of awareness and urgency to combat climate change and, and social inequality. Uh, on the other hand, I did come across a Franklin Templeton survey on LinkedIn last week uh, with the question, how worried are you that uh, climate change could negatively affect the long-term value of an investment? And uh, the votes in this um, uh, Gallup, let's say, were, were evenly spread between uh, very worried, worried, uh, somewhat worried, and not worried at all. And in fact, not worried at all, got about 30% of the votes. Uh, to be honest, I, can, I cannot yet say that individual investors in Cyprus uh, currently, we are currently discussing with ESG investing uh, as a priority. It is still uh, quite obvious that uh, when someone parts with his money, the only thing he cares is not to lose his money. However, uh, we do see when talking with uh, younger investors that future generations are more sensitive uh, to environmental and uh, social issues. Uh, and as, mine as millennials begin to comprise a larger segment of the total pool of investors, you can expect ESG investing to expand right along with them. Uh, I believe that this will reach Cyprus uh, in a few years. Um, on a global scale, demand for ESG is already there, and the financial services industry responded to this growing demand by making moves such as offering ESG-focused uh, ETFs. And uh, in fact, both of the two largest ETF providers, um, BlackRock and Vanguard, uh, offer clients a choice of uh, ESG-focused ESG funds. I therefore believe that pressure does not come solely from regulation. Uh, this movement started by pension funds, institutional investors, and funds with a longer-term investment horizons. Uh, so it is a holistic movement. It is not driven by regulation, but now regulation is catching up and setting more parameters and uh, more formalities around, which is uh, certainly a, a positive development. Uh, the European Union you know, regulations will require the underlying investors to be asked for their investment preferences by whoever is, is investing uh, on their behalf. And EU fund managers are required to collect and report certain ESG data. You know, ESG should not be uh, just a label, and the environmental and social commitments and initiatives should not be exaggerated. Uh, um, additionally, fund managers have to state whether they are funds, uh, the funds that they are promoting uh, ESG characteristics, or whether their funds do not deem ESG risks to be relevant to their investment decision. Um, in five years, this will be much more embedded in the investment process, and uh, every investor will be armed with uh, new tools and will have access to more consistent, comparable data, data sets that will help them make a more, inf a more uh, informed investment decisions. Right. So as far as I understand, your perspective is that ESG is driven mostly by institutional investors at the moment rather than by individual in investors. But you see that in the long term, the ESG will be fully incorporated within the wider investments community uh, considerations. And uh, as uh, Elena Filipova mentioned before, it's Excellent. no longer something that is nice to have but um it, it's it's something that it will be well something more compulsory as, as an ingredient um so thank you for your uh input andreas um i would like to much. welcome now uh, uh omiros um uh to to the panel uh, again so uh let's now jump into a bit of a more technical analysis um, Omiros, could you be, could you uh, tell us a little bit about 
uh, um, what is the purpose of, of ESG metrics and how do you see the ESG metrics uh, become useful for the capital market? Yes, uh, sure. Hi, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Well, basically, the purpose of ESG metrics is to ensure, evaluate uh, how sustainable a company is in generating profits in general terms. It's uh, something investors have come have become more and more aware of, with institutional investors being the pioneers, as Andreas mentioned, uh, in this area, and um, in applying ESG metrics and uh, ESG metric systems for in their decision-making uh, process. A critical factor in the financial performance of investments is the, is the investor's capability and capacity to identify drivers of the risk-return uh, profile. The market is equipped with the tools for recognizing the financial factors that determine the value of an investment. However, uh, in the capital markets, there exists the ever-increasing need to identify and measure factors that are difficult to either quantify and monetize and uh, affect to a great extent the risk return profile. Therefore, we have the need for the ESG metrics and systems. Now, the system's idea is to promote transparency and hold companies responsible for the way they make money by giving them an ESG score. A high score might attract new investors, whereas a low score might deter new investors away. On the other hand, though, just uh, because a company has a low ESG score does not mean it's a bad company or that it's a bad investment, and vice versa, if it has a high score, it does not mean you should invest in the company. Having said this, we should keep in mind that current, all current rating systems uh, uh, are somewhat flawed as they are subjective and their rating systems are not uh, uniform. When uh, someone looks at ESG metrics of a company, what uh, you are looking at is another way of evaluating a company without looking at its financials, but rather looking at how it impacts the society at large. Comparing companies within the same ESG metric system gives the advantage of comparing how well is one company doing compared to another, other things being equal, of course. But it is less useful in looking what is the overall mission of a company in terms of the weight they give on each of the ESG components. Uh, for example, a company might have high score in governance and low scores or medium scores in uh, environmental and uh, social, but overall can have a good ESG score as uh, the scoring systems are now. This comes to be a cumbersome issue for investors that might be more sensitive to one or two of the ESG components for some, environmental is more critical, for some, it's social, for others, it's governance. In this effort, in September 2020, the World Economic Forum released a set of stakeholder capitalist metrics designed to assist in the benchmark, benchmarking of uh, sustainable business performance. The metrics as identified and categorized uh, by the World Economic Forum is on four pillars, uh, each of which includes several ESG, fa ESG factors. These are people, planet, prosperity, and principles of uh, governance. The World Economic Forum is encouraging business to include a full set of metrics in their corporate and financial reporting, but some of these areas currently carry more weight with investors than others, so favoring the most easily measurable uh, and therefore most likely to be included in annual reports or be covered by media. Now, according to surveys, the most important ESG metrics commonly considered by investors are as follows. A formal ESG policy, uh, which provides an overview of a company's social responsibility, health and safety, and the economy again the company environmental positions showing the management's team's ability to monitor and address the respective costs of uh, the organization's operations another uh, uh, factor is the assignment of esg responsibility within the company uh, a third one is a corporate uh, code of ethics to guide management and employees as they carry out the organizational objectives uh, the diversity among employees, board members, and management, and 
finally, the ability to estimate uh, emissions um, that uh, both direct and indirect, basically, including those produced by the wider value chain of uh, the companies. Now, the name of the game is successful investment decision making is balance. Of course, the first and foremost factor is to select companies that will meet your investment returns criteria, as uh, the other panelists already uh, mentioned. But an investor should also consider the factor of sustainability that will lead to better performance over the long run due to better management of uh, the resources of the company. So ESG is not just about finding companies that are green and good for the environment, but rather a strong ESG proposition can help create enormous uh, business value across the companies. The market pushes towards a unified reporting framework and ESG scoring. Uh, as uh, Elena mentioned before, and uh, I totally agree with her, uh, the full implementation of uh, the ESG uh, policies requires education, transparency, integration of data, technology, including machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, and resources, and only through such a system, a reliable and objective overview of ESG risk assess uh, assessment can be, can be delivered to the market. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Omiros, for this uh, rather uh, detailed and enlightening analysis. Um, I'm keeping what you said uh, at the end, uh, that the name of the game in successful investment decision making is balance. Um, I would also like uh, to have your own view and your own perspective on, uh, on the investor side. Um, how do you see yourself the development of ESG criteria integration in the investor's pers perspective? Let's also hear from you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, historically, we've seen uh, ESG investments uh, had a reputation of requiring a trade-off on the investor's part because they limited the universe of uh, companies that were eligible for investment. They also limited the investor's pro potential for profit. More recently, however, some investors have come to believe that ESG criteria have a practical purpose beyond any ethical concerns. By considering ESG criteria, the investors may be able to avoid companies whose practices could signal a material risk factor. Examples could be seen in uh, BP's uh, 2010 oil spill, Volkswagen's emission scandal, and the even the collapse of the financial sector in 2009 crisis, all of which plunged the company's stock prices and resulted in billions of losses. Similarly, uh, we've seen that social and environmental practices tend to attract impact investors um, in the whole uh, framework of the um, uh, sustainability uh, universe. As impact investing appeals largely to young generations such as millennials or Generation X, this trend is likely to expand as these investors gain more influence and participation in the market. And since bottom line in, uh, is the foremost factor, investors want to profit. Uh, if we take a the survey by the Global Impact Investing Network in uh, 2020, 2020, we see that uh, more than 88% of impact investors reported their investments were meeting or even surpassing their financial expectations. Thus, because making profits is always a vogue and ESG criteria are contributing factors to returns, it is expected that all investors would embrace them at a large scale in the near future. Thank you, Omiros. I've seen that both yourself and, uh, and Andreas uh, drawn uh, upon how uh, millennials drive uh, ESG investing, and it will be very interesting indeed to see how the trend will evolve as uh, millennials will be gaining more uh, share in the market. Um, let's now move on, on Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, good afternoon to you as well. 
Um, Stephanie, as part of uh, the Invest Cyprus team and as head of strategic projects, uh, could you please tell, tell us a little bit about the actions that Cyprus is currently taking and how does um, it uh, aims to reach its target uh, for ESG investment? here uh, it looks like we can't hear you very well um, is there uh, a chance uh, you could uh, do something to improve your network because it looks like we have a bit of a technical problem here is it better now no unfortunately not i understand that you can Maybe it will help if you could log in again. Okay, okay. I would like to ask from the audience to bear with us uh, for a moment as we're trying to resolve this technical issue. And um, we perhaps um, could take. Uh... Are you sure now? No, unfortunately not. Um, can you please log out okay. and log in again? Yeah, yeah. Just give me uh, two minutes. Then. Okay. Um, perhaps we could use this time to uh, ask another question uh, to the other two panelists. Um, Andreas, uh, could you please briefly tell us how significant uh, will the role of investment funds be um, in the funding of the real economy in Cyprus, especially uh, in sectors that are considered as green? Sure. Um, we hope that um, very soon investment funds um, will be one of the main pillars of participation uh, or funding of the real economy of Cyprus uh, in the energy sector, the hospitality sector, and other sectors um, which will have a positive impact on the environment and the society uh, of the country. And we take every action to explain to both uh, public and private bodies the best ways uh, with which the contribution of the fund sector can, uh, can be multiplied, uh, either through co-investment facilities uh, or through simplification of taxation and um, other incentives in this direction. Thank you, Andreas. I'll make another attempt to reach out to Stephanie again. Uh, Stephanie, could you could you uh, say hi to see if we 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 have you on board? Okay, so I see that she's locked offline right now. Um, so let's move on to to ask another question to to Omiros. Um, Omiros, um, I see that there is a debate about the materiality um, of the ESG issues. Uh, could you please tell us what defines materiality and uh, is it common across all industries? Uh, that is one size fits all? Yes, um, 
Okay, let's uh, first see how uh, materiality is defined. Uh, uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board uh, defines materiality as information which would be considered decision relevant to an investor. Similarly, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board uh, that uh, its work focuses on the subset of sustainability issues that are financially material has determined what is material ESG issue in each industry and mapped them in the SASB materiality map, which is uh, broadly used by currently by the market. Now, recent studies have shown that uh, there exists a positive correlation between material ESG issues for each specific company and their respective financial performance. Of course, you should always have in mind that each industry, sector, and company have different ESG issues that are material to them. For example, let's consider the social capital issue, uh, the social capital issues of uh, the asset management companies and the commercial banks that both belong in the financial uh, industry. For commercial banks, the issues identified uh, as material. Uh, is um, data security and access and affordability. Whereas for the asset managers, the material issue uh, identified by the board, SASB, is selling practices and product labeling. So as you put it, uh, one size does not fit all. Each, uh, each uh, company, each sector, each industry, depending on the specialization they have within the sector uh, and their operations, um, uh, we have uh, different um, ESG issues becoming material and immaterial interchangeably. Thank you, Amiras. Uh, I'll try to get a hold of, of Stephanie now. Um, Stephanie, uh, hi again. Hi, Nicole. Um, it looks like we can hear you very well now, and I'm really okay. uh, glad because uh, it will be a pleasure to, to, to hear from you. Um, as, as I mentioned before, Stephanie, you're part of the Invest uh, Cyprus team and you're the head of strategic projects. So uh, could you please um, quickly tell us a little bit about um, the actions that uh, Cyprus is currently taking uh, and how does it aim to reach its target for ESG investments? Um, thank you, Nicole. Apologies to everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly now. Um, given that uh, we have very limited time, I'll try to give you a, an overview of what the country has done so far um, as better as possible. Um, so um, I would like to mention that uh, Cyprus is taking a lead in the development uh, towards a transition to green economy, not only to restore the country to financial health, but also to embrace important new investment opportunities to diversify our economy. Um, of course, I would like to mention that a significant milestone that was achieved in December 2020 as part of our efforts on cleaner energy generation uh, was, was the, um, uh, by European Investment Bank that they decided to provide substantial banking for the construction of the 150 million gas-fired Basilikos power plant which obviously will contribute to the production of enough electricity. Also in 2020, we began work on an um, almost uh, 300 million floating LNG storage unit in Vasilikos Bay, again financed by the EIB, which is expected to reduce our carbon footprint by around 30%. Another significant progress that has been made on this and other environmental and sustainability initiatives is the European Union's Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility Plan, uh, Cyprus will spend um, around 1 billion million euros available to be structured on five policy areas, of course, directly linked um, to the ESG factors, um, public health and civil protection, green transition, economic competitiveness, digital transition, labor market education and human capital. The plan includes measures to modernize the healthcare sector, Increase the, energy, increase the energy efficiency of buildings, promote sustainable transport and digital infrastructure. These projects have a timeline to cover up to uh, 2026. Um, furthermore, um, um, as you 
um, probably all know Cyprus is a leading maritime uh, nation uh, with the third largest merchant fleet in Europe. And we announced recently some new incentives to reduce the shipping industry's greenhouse gas emissions. Cyprus flagged ships, which are almost up to 1,000, will receive up to a 30% discount on tonnage tax if they reduce their impact on the environment by cutting overall fuel consumption and using lower carbon emitting fuels. Um, other subsidy schemes for green transition have also been announced uh, for the years 2021 and 2027. So well, obviously the government is, is making the right steps to support uh, businesses and facilitate the transition to the circular economy and to the green economy. Um, towards a long-term growth model, of course, uh, I, um, I have to mention as well that tourism has also a role to play. And yet we are conscious of our responsibility to implement hotel compliance with environmental standards and sustainable business practices. Um, as you have heard at the beginning, we are the government's investment authority and um, our aim is to identify and promote projects uh, that have a as an, an ESG angle. So um, if for investors it's priority to invest in ESG projects, then that makes this a priority for us to identify uh, the right projects as well. Um, so that brings me uh, to, uh, to um, inform you that we have created as well a true invest unit as part of our broader pro project bank, as you have heard at the beginning that constitutes a one-stop show for institutional investors, private equity funds or family offices uh, to support um, the investment into projects that align with the government's green strategy. And uh, lastly, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, we are now formulating our 2035 Cyprus long-term growth strategy to turn Cyprus as Europe's sustainable business and trading hub. This is the vision for up to 2035, and um, it, it's aimed on actions aiming to turn Cyprus to one of the best places to live, work, and, and do business. And um, I'm cautious of the time, so probably I will, I will stop here. And I just wanted to conclude uh, with a comment that in the same way, uh, foreign investment implementing eco-friendly policies will also lead the way, turning the climate and the environmental challenges into opportunities. Thank you, Stephanie. It is indeed encouraging to hear that Cyprus has been very proactive in attracting sustainable projects and sustainable investing. Um, uh, so I believe that's a wrap. Um, we do apologize for the uh, minor technical issues, but we are trying to deal with technology the best way we can, given the circumstances. And we do hope that uh, we'll be holding our seminars uh, live and in and physical version uh, as, as soon as we get out of, of the pandemic uh, era. I'll now return uh, the floor to Marius for a few closing remarks. Uh, Marius, back to you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, uh, Nicole. And thank you, all panelists, for shedding some more light on the current ESG landscape in Cyprus from the industry's point of view. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our webinar, which I hope you have enjoyed and found it interesting. We will be staying in touch with you and circulate the relevant links to watch the video on demand if you want to do so again. And we will also be sharing the presentation slides of the speakers who presented. A huge thank you again to Refinitiv, all the speakers and collaborators from Invest Cyprus. SIFA for making this event a success. We do hope to see you next time and wish you a pleasant evening. Bye-bye.